Two years ago, Apple shocked the world with the introduction of Ask Not to Track. For the first time in forever, a big tech company was siding with the people and preventing data collection. This update had real consequences as well. Facebook, for example, was losing as much as $10 billion per year in revenue just because of that little pop-up. This isn't too surprising though, as 96% of iOS users were disabling in-app tracking, despite Mark's pleas that they opt in. In the meantime, Apple was receiving a bunch of praise for giving users the choice. Of course, no one was stupid enough to think that Apple was actually doing this for the people, but it was concluded that this was mainly just a marketing strategy. Apple has always advertised the iPhone with the allure of privacy, so this move would surely strengthen Apple's brand loyalty and it might even convert some Android users. But what if I told you that all of that was just stage one? You see, pushing out Facebook and Google wasn't actually a marketing move, it was an offensive move. Now that Apple has effectively shut off everyone from collecting deep data on iOS users, guess who advertisers have to rely on to get access to iOS users? The answer is Apple. This wasn't just something that Apple stumbled into either. While they like to portray themselves as the hardware giant that just wants to create the best products possible, Apple is actually becoming a software company, and the reasoning is obvious, and it's way more profitable. You know how Apple charges ludicrous amounts for their products? Well, even with that pricing, Apple's gross margin on their products is only 37%. Their gross margin on their seemingly cheap services, however, is a whopping 71%. It looks like offering services like Apple Music and iCloud not only garners less criticism, but it's way more profitable as well. But by far the most profitable service in the world is serving ads, and Apple wants a piece of this pie. So here's Apple's master plan to take over iOS advertising. This might seem like a recent development. But this story actually dates back nearly 10 years to September 19, 2014. This was the long-anticipated release date of the iPhone 6. Rumors had been flying wild for months, people had been camping outside of Apple Store for days, and the hype was unreal. Apple was finally releasing larger format iPhones. At the same time, the general public was finally coming around to the idea of spending several hundred dollars on a smartphone, and for many, the iPhone 6 was their first smartphone, including myself. All of this culminated in Apple selling a ridiculous 220 million iPhone 6s and iPhone 6 Pluses. Apple had done better than ever before, but this was the peak of iPhone sales. Every year after that, iPhone sales inched down step by step. This wasn't really Apple's fault. The reality was that smartphone progression was rapidly slowing down, phones lasted for years, and everyone who wanted an iPhone already had one. But while this was a reasonable explanation, Apple couldn't just tell this to shareholders. If Tim Apple had done this, well, he probably would have gotten the boot and be replaced by someone who was quote-unquote more ambitious. So Tim had to do something. His first instinct was to raise prices. I mean, if you want to make the same revenue off of less units, the easiest way out is to just raise prices. With the iPhone 7, Apple increased the price of the Plus series by $20, and with the iPhone 8, Apple increased the price of both series by a total of $50. But by far the biggest jump in price came with the iPhone X, which came in at $1,000. In the Western world, this phone was named as the $1,000 emoji machine, but this phone actually sold extraordinarily well in China, ending Apple's sales decline. It seemed like the increased pricing was working, and Apple would double down on the strategy with their next generation. The iPhone XR would come in at an eye-watering $750, and Apple introduced a new Max version that started at $1,100. We have since gotten more used to these prices, but to this day, when adjusting for inflation, these were the most expensive iPhones Apple has ever released. And this quickly became evident in their performance. Sales were terrible. In fact, they were so bad that Apple didn't even want to tell us how bad they were. Instead, they would just go ahead and stop reporting unit sales numbers altogether. Unsurprisingly, Apple would go ahead and reduce the starting price of the iPhone for the first time ever with the iPhone 11. This led to a much better response with the public, but this was by no means an end game for Apple. They were back to square one, and they had to not only address declining iPhone sales, but they also had to find new ways to grow. They were finding some success with AirPods and the newer Macs, 
but what they really needed was a full-on new sector. As they looked around them, the answer became obvious. Out of all the tech giants, they were the only ones focusing on hardware. Everyone else was focusing on software. Apple likes to market themselves as the premium company making premium priced products, and based on public sentiment, it seems like this messaging has stuck really well. Everyone views Apple products as expensive, luxurious, and exclusive. But ever since the disaster with the iPhone XR and XS, Apple has actually been making their products more accessible than ever. Back in the day, Apple would discontinue their previous iPhones as soon as the new version came out. But nowadays, they're keeping around the older generations for years, and they have models priced as low as $429. In fact, if you look at the current pricing of the SE, 12, and 13, it's not much different from the pricing of the Pixel series, which is known for offering great value. Apple will never advertise this though. As Google has found out firsthand, most people don't actually want a value product. What they really want is a premium exclusive product, but for a value price. And this is precisely what Apple has been offering. They have their fancy Pro series and their $1,000 stand and their $700 wheels to establish the status of their brand. But their real revenue drivers are their lower priced products. I mean, if you're smart about your trade-ins, you can get an iPhone that's one or two generations old from your carrier for $100, $200 max. You might even be able to get it for free. This strategy doesn't just apply to iPhones either. Apple has made their lower tier products value-centric across the board. I mean, you can literally get the iPad 9th generation for $329. Even if you spring for the iPad Pro, it's substantially cheaper than the flagship iPhones. The same thing can be said about the Mac lineup as well. Apple was already offering great value with the M1 Mac Mini that came in at $700, but they've taken this to another level with the M2. Despite all the inflation, Apple didn't just keep the price the same, but they've actually knocked it down to $600. At that price, the M2 Mac Mini is arguably the best value desktop computer on the market, period. You can see similar trends with the Apple Watch and the MacBook lineup as well. But wait a minute, why in the world is Apple doing this? Wouldn't these lower priced products just exacerbate their revenue and profit margin problems? Well, yes and no. Obviously, these lower priced products will have much more modest revenue per unit and margins, but they'll also sell better. This will keep the overall revenue from each sector relatively stable or even growing. But net margin will indeed go down, and that's exactly what Apple experienced for much of the 2010s. Between 2012 and 2020, Apple saw their net margin fall from 27% down to 20%. This might not sound like a big deal, but when we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars worth of revenue, this translates to tens of billions of dollars worth of plus profit. This is why Apple's net income didn't increase all that much during this time period, despite the revenue nearly doubling. Apple was okay with this though because they had something much bigger in the works, and this was just stage one, user collection. As Apple offered more value-driven products and locked more people into the Apple ecosystem, they were simultaneously doubling down on their services. Likely the most notable example is Apple Music. Fun fact, Steve Jobs actually hated the idea of music subscriptions. He said that even Jesus couldn't sell music subscriptions, and this was really the premise of iTunes as a whole. The idea of iTunes was that people could buy virtually any track in the world and keep it forever for a reasonable 99 cents. But Apple scrapped this idea altogether in mid-2015 when they announced Apple Music. If you've been living under a rock, Apple Music is a music streaming subscription similar to Spotify. But unlike Apple's brand image, Apple Music was once again reasonably priced. In fact, Apple Music was priced identically to Spotify. Pair this with Apple's beautiful integration with your devices, and you end up with 88 million users paying you $10 or more every single month. I mean, that itself is nearly a billion dollars per month. But that's nothing in comparison to their cloud business. iCloud is, once again, priced basically identically to Google Drive, but it comes along with the whole Apple aesthetic and convenience. And boom! By 2018, Apple had an estimated 850 million iCloud users, out of which 170 million were paying. Apple had found a golden strategy. They didn't have to reinvent the wheel by any means. 
they just had to take already popular services, integrate it into the Apple world, and offer it for the same price. And boom, they suddenly had tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of paying subscribers. They deployed this same strategy with Apple TV, Apple Arcade, Apple News, Apple Fitness, Apple Care, and who knows what else. This was working relatively well by the end of the 2010s, but the real explosion didn't come till the pandemic. Suddenly, everyone was at home, and they needed even more virtual entertainment than before. They needed more music, more games, more TV, more media. They also had a bunch of money saved up from not going on vacation and not going out nearly as often. So they resorted to spending much of their money on tech, and guess who was in the perfect position to take advantage of this? Well, it was actually all of the big tech companies, which of course included Apple. Within the 12 months following the start of the pandemic, Apple's revenue grew by over $100 billion, and their net income nearly doubled. And today, Apple boasts an impressive 935 million paid subscribers worldwide. In other words, one-eighth of the world has some sort of paid Apple-based subscription. Apple had done it. They successfully transitioned from being a hardware giant to being a hardware-slash-software giant. But Apple wasn't satisfied. They wanted to take it one step further as they were still missing out on the most lucrative service of them all, advertising. Apple wasn't just going to start offering ads like Google or Facebook though. As we all know, Apple likes to do everything the Apple way with finesse and clever positioning. So they decided to leverage public angst. The shady habits of Google and Facebook were no longer a secret. Their business practices were very much public knowledge, and people hated them for it. Now, of course, people didn't hate it enough to switch, but they did hate it enough to complain. So what better way to create an advertising monopoly than to side with the public and block out external data collection? This was a win-win-win-win scenario. One, Apple was hurting their brand image of their competitors by basically suggesting that what they were doing was wrong. Two, they were hurting the revenue and the bottom line of their competitors big time. Three, they were bolstering their own brand image as the privacy king. And four, they had ultimate control over all advertising within the Apple ecosystem. We should also note that Apple has been experimenting with more team advertising for several years now. They've been selling ad spots within the App Store and Apple News since 2016 actually. So they're by no means complete newbies to the space, but they're about to take this the next level. Since August, Apple has been hiring a substantial number of engineers to work on some sort of large-scale ad platform. It's expected that this new platform will essentially be Apple's version of Google or Facebook ads. But wait a minute, Apple can't just bash on Google and Facebook for years and then turn around and do the exact same thing, right? I mean, Tim Cook himself has argued that ad-driven business models are inherently invasive to privacy. So how could Apple make such a pivot without destroying their branding? Well, the answer is likely by introducing an Apple twist. In other words, they'll throw in some encryption, some decentralization, and some anonymity, and they'll frame it as something that protects privacy. We can already see something along these lines with their hide my email feature. If you're not familiar with this feature, it basically allows you to generate a proxy email address when signing up for websites or emailing people. Apple doesn't read or process any of the emails that go through this proxy address, and I suspect that they'll implement something similar when it comes to ads. Maybe all of the data that they collect will be stored locally on your device, which will check off the decentralization checkbox. After that, maybe they'll use some sort of anonymous proxy tunnel that's end-to-end -end encrypted to connect advertisers to your device. This way, they can claim that they or the advertisers know your data themselves. There's simply a proxy that connects advertisers and end consumers while protecting your privacy. Or at least, that's what the pitch will probably be. In the end, Apple was the only megatech company that didn't drive most of their revenue from software and services. But over the past several years, this has been rapidly changing. The reality is that smartphones have hit a plateau and Apple can only introduce the next iPhone that's better than ever before and increase the price so many times. In fact, I believe that it's just a matter of time until Apple drops the number naming scheme on the iPhone. Before you know it, the new iPhone will be called the 2027 iPhone as opposed to the iPhone 19. This will no doubt reduce the hype surrounding iPhone launches, but that's okay. By then, Apple will not only be a software giant, 
but it will be a full-on software company. Their iPhones, Macs, iPads, and watches will simply be a vehicle to sell their real money producers, subscriptions, and services. It looks like the latest effort in making this vision a reality is getting into ads, and that's why Apple really shut out external tracking. What do you think about Apple getting into the ad business? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you respect the business decision, but hate the implications. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas, and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Ari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.